I don't know what that was all about. Good morning, everyone. So glad to see you all here on this beautiful Sunday morning. In the bulletins, you will see that there are some upcoming events. I want you to beware of them and join us where we can, especially the church picnic that's coming up and then the Lily Project that's also happening. Um, there's a couple announcements regarding our building. Uh, as you have probably saw, we have new floorings over in the office area. But also, we are getting new floorings down in the basement. So right now, the basement is a mess. I suggest you don't go down there. Um, and, and so if you need to use the bathroom, just walk through here and use the one in the office area instead of going down into the basement. I won't mind if it's doing the sermon, okay? So, and then, uh, so we're still going to be putting the office together this week, so give us patience and extra grace as we, um, as we do that. Um, pray for our sanity as we also try to figure out what's all going on. And then on Friday is Charlotte Fitch's memorial service. Um, that starts at 11 o'clock here. So um, if you are able to join us in that celebration of life, please do so. And then lastly, I have a personal announcement I want to share with you. Um, I will not be with you for the month of, um, for the month of August. I have, um, I have been, uh, this month has been a very rough and tough month for me personally. As you all know, I was born and raised my first eight years in Vietnam, and there were some um, unresolved post-traumatic stress disorder that I experienced there that I thought was resolved, and it hasn't, and um, it's caused a lot of havoc in my life. And as a result, with consultation with my therapist, but also with the bishop, I'm going to go to a post-traumatic stress disorder treatment facility down in Arizona for the next month. And so I'm going to go, I'm going to go there on Saturday and, and be there I will be unavailable for any form of ministry because I won't, be, I won't have any access to the outside world. And so the bishop and um, our office will be working together to find worship leadership and pastoral care so that you are not left out hanging. He is very much supporting me to go this. And, and so I, a couple of weeks ago, I spoke with the church leadership, and they have given me the time off to do so. And so I thank the church leadership. I thank all of you for your grace and your patience. And then um, I ask for your prayers. I need it. <laughs> My family needs it. And so, um, and so this will really help me in my, in my journey toward becoming a fuller person and overcoming PTSD. But it will not be the end of the journey. It will be pretty much you know, part of the journey. It'll take me a few, a couple years probably to really overcome it. And so in the whole, through all of that, I ask you to just for your prayers and all that. So I plan to be here for Charlotte's uh, memorial service and then probably take off the next day. Okay. So thank you for your grace. Thank you for your understanding. And I look forward to being with you in September. All right. All right. With that, let us prepare our hearts and our minds as we uh, begin our worship. Please rise. 
We are gathered in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of our neighbors. Uh, Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned, we have hurt our community, squandered your blessing, and hoarded your bounty. In the name of Jesus, forgive us and grant us your mercy. Amen. Claim the gift of God's mercy. You are freed and forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you.
Sorry. Faithful God, most merciful judge, you care for your children with firmness and compassion. By your spirit, nurture us who live in your kingdom, that we may be rooted in the way of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 44. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. Who is like me? Let them proclaim it. Let them declare and set it forth before me. Who has announced from of old the things to come? Let them tell us what is yet to be. Do not fear or be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? There is no other rock. I know not one. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. Today's gospel reading is from the gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 13, starting at verse 24. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore again, then the weeds appeared as, uh, as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers. Collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into his house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evil doers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I'll, I'll stay still because it's something with the connection. Today's gospel text is, um, we're right now in the heart of some of the darker texts of St. Matthew. This is where a lot of the uh, not-so-fun part that I have to preach on occurs. And Matthew really likes to go all in on the weeping and gnashing of teeth and the dark imagery of, um, of sin. And so bear with me as I speak about this and try to make it so that it's not so... Um, uh, intimidating and, um, and scary. The thing about this particular text is that St. Matthew is preaching to a group of people that only know right and wrong, and that's the people of the first century. In those days, life was so uncertain that you had to either know what you were doing was right 
or what you were doing was wrong, otherwise you would get in trouble. There was very little grayness in the world at that time. And whatever grayness there was, they dismissed it. And so everything had to be either black or white, had to be one way or the other, had to be clearly identified to be threatening or not. And so St. Matthew, writing in the time of Christ, you know, not long after Christ, was employing that understanding, that, um, that mindset as he wrote the Gospels. And so as a result, a lot of this text is really scary and really, um, you know, um, black and white in many ways. But in our modern ears, what this really text is really talking about is our relationship, with, obviously, with God and with our and God's neighbor. This really, this to understand this text, we really need to understand God's, you know, um, God's commandment to the Israelites, but also what Jesus says about the great commandment. You know, in Deuteronomy six five, God says through Moses, you know, that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and you should love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus quotes that when the young lawyer asked him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And God, uh, Jesus uh, quotes, you know, what they call the Shema, and then says everything else hangs on this particular commandment, that you should love God and you should love your neighbor. And so here, this particular text is hanging on that understanding, on the Shema, on the fact that we should love God and love our neighbors. And so what is happening here is that Jesus is sharing that we are all born with goodness within us, that we all have goodness, we have God, we have Christ in, in our midst. And so, therefore, if we follow the guidance of Christ, if we live the best we know and we are faithful in our journey, God will bless us and will do whatever we need to continue that life. But we often have choices, and so as a result, we often make the wrong mistakes, and we do things that do not bring about growth, do not bring about life, and instead we bring about darkness, and instead we bring about the things that hinders God's ministry through us into the world. And so as a result, when that happens, Christ's ministry, the goodness of the world, is clouded and shrouded in some form of distractions and darkness. And so as a result, that gets in the way of bringing forth the kingdom of God. And so as a result, we, in Christ, is telling us that we must be aware of what it is, the damage that we do to each other. And when we do that, we get, a, uh, and, and, and when we understand that, we get a certain clarity. But even when we are clear about it, we still make wrong mistakes. And yet this text ends with Christ saying, but God is there. God, we, that Christ is with us, that the goodness of Christ is still in the midst, and that at the end it is Christ whose ministry and whose word of salvation will win, will be the one that brings forth the goodness, the good news of life, and that all the distractions of the world and all that is evil will be brought into the furnace. And so how, to, how we understand that is really we need to understand our relationship. How is it? How do we live? Well, we live, we have good aspects about ourselves, and we have not so many great aspects about ourselves. You know, Martin Luther is famous for a lot of his sayings, but perhaps one of his most famous lines is that he says, we are both saints and sinners, right? All at once, we are both saints and sinners. We are always walking that paradox between being a great person and being that not-so-great person. We're always struggling to be a child of God, bringing forth the kingdom of God, and yet we still struggle with, the, um, uh, you know, with, um, with our animalistic side where we bring out some of the worst aspects of humanity. And so as a result, we struggle all the time, every day, every moment of our lives and how to be the, the better person. The attraction of evil, the attraction of the things that are not good for us continues to, to pull us away, but yet God's word and his salvation, his freeing message brings us, also tears us over towards him. You know, Plato, I'm sorry, Aristotle had this model of, of, of humanity in that we're always going up and down a staircase. The, the more goodness we be, the more good that we do, the more we become more like God. We become more divine, and so we go up the steps 
and the more we do the bad things, we become more like the rocks, the inanimate stuff in the world. You know, um, his model of life is that we're always going up and down a staircase, going between the divine and the dead, the divine and the inanimate objects like rocks. And so as a result, we're always being pulled in life. And so, so my offer to you uh, to understand this text is first allow yourself to be free of the constant guilt that you may experience, that we do struggle. We are human beings. We are always going to be going up and down that ladder. We're always going to be pulled in multiple directions. And sometimes some of those pulls in the wrong direction creates guilt, and we live with it for years to come. It creates dilemmas that we struggle for years to come, and it distracts us from ever being a better person. But I'm telling you, what Christ says to us is that we don't have to let the things that brings us down closer to the rocks of the world be the burden that we carry, but instead let, share all that like we, did, uh, like we talked about last Sunday, give all that up to Christ and be committed to being more like the divine God and be good. We choose to be good. We can be good. Christ takes all that burdens us and allows us to be free from it. You know, so many of us live life lives of so much sadness, of so much fear, of so much that, that prevents us from ever becoming more than we can be. But when I read the Gospels, when I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and when I read all of the Bible, what I see is God's constantly working us. And sometimes he's working us in ways we don't even know. This morning, I prayed to God. I said, Lord, cut me to the quick. Cut me to the bare bones. Mold me and just bring me down into the hounds of hell and make me into the, uh, into every, break me down into every atom so that you can rebuild me and mold me into the person that you envision. And I remember Jeremiah and his famous illustration of the, of the potter's wheel. We have to be able to allow God to just break us into a clump of clay and be brought back, shaped and molded into his image, into the image that we can be, into the person that we are invited to be. But it takes a lot of resolve of us to do so. It's intimidating as heck to go deep inside us and find all that is wrong with us and all that we can be. And the world is constantly telling us we can't. But here the gospel is telling us we can. And, and the gospel text today reminds us that we can. We don't have to let the enemies of our lives get us in the way. But God, who is there, is wanting to bring us to the greater heights of life into the point where we can live and bask in his love. And through that basking of his love, we are empowered to share that with our neighbors. God isn't asking us to be heroic. He's asking us to be faithful. He's asking us to just let him continually to mold us. One of my favorite characters in all of the Bible is Jacob. Jacob. You know, if you want to read about him, go to like the 22nd chapter of Genesis. He has the longest narrative, longest section in the entire 50 chapters of Genesis. He has the longest sequence. And, in, in, um, and his story begins with him being one of the twins, right? You remember? And, in that, and, then, and, and he is born jealous to begin with. And he's jealous because he's not the firstborn. Esau was. And so what does he do? He spends the rest of his life conniving and cheating and lying. And he does everything he can to get ahead of his brother. And finally, his brother one day is so hungry, he's so famished, he must have not eaten for days. He's like, I'm willing to give up my birthright just so I can get a bowl of soup. I'm like, a bowl of soup, really? I've had great soup, but not worth it, right, for your birthright. But he, he gave up all his inheritance. He gave up all of his position as, a pers as the future authoritative voice in the family as being the oldest just for a bowl of soup. And so he does. And then Jacob dresses up like a hairy Esau to fool his dad, who is blind at this point and must have been deaf, because how can you not tell the difference between your kids' voices, right? But he does, and then he gets the birthright. 
And then comes that fateful day. He's walking. All of a sudden, God strikes him right there. He has a wrestling match. He is fighting. And one day I can talk to you about that whole story and what all that means. But he comes face to face with God. And what does God do? He breaks him down. He comes to the edge of the river. It's getting dark. He has his family that he sends across. He has all the livestock that he's stolen from his uncle Laban. Yet another example of a bad person. And so he's now at the river's edge. It's dark. He cannot ford the river because he might die in the raging water. But his family's on their side. He's alone. God came to him. And in that night of wrestling, God broke him down and made him down into, um, uh, broke him down into the atoms of his being. And then at, by the end of the evening, into the morning, he builds him back up. And you know what he does after that? He becomes a new man. You know what he does? He knows part of the reason why he didn't cross the river that night is that he knew Esau and his army were coming to find him, and, he, and, they, and they were going to kill him. And he also knew that behind him was Uncle Laban coming to get him because you don't steal other people's livestock. That's a matter of life and death. Back then, you steal people's livestock, you get shot. So he knew he was either going to cross the river and die go across the river to survive the crossing and potentially die at the face of his brother or his uncle was coming. He was literally at the end of his rope. He had no other way of escaping. God found him then, broke him down, rebuilt him, blessed him, and he ends up crossing the river that next morning. He comes face to face. You can read it in the 32nd chapter. He comes face to face with Esau, And he says to Esau, no, no, Esau says to him, you know, I look upon you and I forgive you, but not only that, but I see the face of God in you. What's so powerful about the story of Jacob is that he was the the ideal person of a person who could never, ever be brought back from the brink of evil. And yet miracle happened. He did. Last week I shared with you about St. Augustine. This was a man who lived such a hedonistic life that there was no hope that he would ever find God. But his mother, St. Monica, prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And he found God at 33 years old. There are, the world is full and replete with history of people who have wandered far from God and somehow God still finds them, breaks them, mold them up again, and they become the shining example of what God intends for all of humanity. Today's gospel text reminds us that we can live, we can choose always to be weeds or wheat. God can always, always work with wherever we're at, even if we've lived a lifetime full of weeds in our lives. God can still take us, but it takes us at this point to allow God to work with us. And so I invite you to be like Jacob wherever you are in your life and allow God to mold you, to be like St. Augustine and to allow the prayers around you to take hold and allow your heart to be open so that it can find its rest with the Lord. And then when that happens, just let God and let yourself be. And let's see what miracles occur. And I think that you, what you will find is that mercy will abound about you. Guilt will dissipate. may not completely disappear, but it will dissipate. And you will find a freer understanding of life and a more joyful way of living. And so let this be a time where you rededicate your life to God, as I will be doing this next month. And let this time be a time where we, together, find ways in which we love one another, serve each other, forgive each other's faults, and find the joy in each other. So that when people come into this building, they can't help but feel the presence of God, experience great joy, and know that the gospel is preached, not just in me, but in all of us. Let us let that be our new resolve. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we're so grateful that you don't ever give up on us, that you 
give us opportunities to find you all the time. And that when we continue to even choose to walk far from you, you continue to search us and find us. And Lord, when we are able to be back in your embrace, help us to share that with others. Give us the courage to come back to you. Give us the strength to endure all the transformation that we need so that we can become the great disciples that you intend for us as we proclaim to the world that is often dwelling in pain, in hurt and darkness, that your light shines in all corners of this world. In your name we pray, amen. Please rise.
Let us confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, uh, ascended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen. Confident that God receives our joys and concerns, let us offer our prayers for the church, those in need, and all of creation. You name each of us as your children. Guide our hospitality ministry to welcome all, our education ministry to equip us for faithful living, and our social ministry to enact the gospel in our community. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. O God, you call your church to both near and far. Guide your church as it seeks your wisdom and shares it, trusting your spirit bearing witness among us. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You desire peace among nations and people. Guard our neighborhoods from hatred, watch over police officers and firefighters, and teach us to advocate for those who live in fear. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for those in need and those facing critical situations. We pray for those who are ill, especially those on our prayer list and those we now name in your presence. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We give thanks for saints and prophets who have received the free gift of God, which is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, especially Hazel Bro, Orvis Wren, Pauline Prozowski, Winant Bud Bennett, Charles Wendell, Elizabeth Davies, Shirley Bennett, Gustav Anderson, and George Elias. May their lives a humble service inspire us in faith. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for the peace in the world, especially in war-torn areas, and for the safety of all military personnel, especially those who have congregational ties. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Into your hands, O oh God, we commend all for whom we pray trusting in the name of the one who reconciled all creation to himself, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. And now the peace of the Lord be with you always. And also, also with you. let us share that peace with one another.
Lest these gifts we bring before you receive this offering, receive our very lives, fit us for humble, joyful service in your name. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. God, whole, uh, my, uh, holy God, mighty Lord, gracious Father, endless is your mercy and eternal your reign. You have filled all creation with light and life. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. We praise you for the grace shown to your people in every age, the promise to Israel, the rescue from Egypt, the gift of the promised land, the words of the prophets, and at this end of all the ages, the gift of your Son, who proclaimed the good news in word and deed and was obedient to your will, even to giving his life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Therefore, O God, with this bread and cup, we remember the life our Lord offered for us. And believing the witness of his resurrection, we await his coming in power to share with us the great and promised feast. Send now, we pray, your Holy Spirit, that we who share in Christ's blood and body may live to the praise of your glory and receive our inheritance with all your saints in light. Join our prayers with all those of your servants of every time and every place and unite them with the ceaseless petitions of our, of our great high priest until he comes as victorious Lord of all. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours. Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now let us pray together the prayer our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All people are called to Christ's table. Come, eat what is good. And we invite all baptized Christians to join us at the Lord's Supper. You may be seated.
please rise. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you always in his name. Amen. Generous God, we thank you for the refreshment we have received at your banquet table. Send us now to spread your generosity into all the world through the one who is our dearest treasure, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And as you go on your way, remember always that the God who calls across the cosmos and speaks in the smallest seed, bless us in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.